The sixth chapter of Second Samuel can be labeled doing a right thing in a wrong way. I suppose that this would be just uh, another way of putting in the negative that ancient epigram, the end justifies the means. Now, there have been a great many organizations and individuals that use that as their philosophy of life. Now, I do not mean to suggest that David, that was his philosophy of life, for it was not. But in the particular incident that's recorded in the sixth chapter, that is certainly true. And this is a page from, I think, one of the greatest days in the life of David. Suppose you'd want to choose the greatest day in the life of David. What day would you choose? Would it be the day that Samuel poured the anointing oil on him as a young shepherd boy? That was a great day. And how about the day that he slew Goliath the giant? That was a great day. And certainly his first romance with Michael, a king's daughter that was given to him in marriage, though the motive of Saul was a pretty base motive. Then probably you'd say the day he escaped from Saul. And then it might be the death of Saul, for that meant he was to ascend the throne. Probably you would think it was the day that he was made king of all Israel and the crown was put upon him. Or maybe you might even want to suggest it was that sin with Bathsheba. It might be also the day that his son Absalom rebelled against him and the day he was slain. Or maybe the day that Solomon was anointed. All of these were great days in the life of a great man. But I believe that the sixth chapter here records this event and then that in the seventh chapter, the two, I would say both of them, are great events and the greatest in the life of David. Now, this is the day that he brought up the ark of God up to Jerusalem. Now, the ark of the covenant, that denoted the presence of God among these people. Those of you that are not acquainted with the floor plan of the tabernacle, probably I should suggest to you again a book I have on the tabernacle, God's Portrait of Christ. And I specialize in these articles of furniture and their location in the tabernacle and then in the temple. There was in the outer court the burnt altar, and there was the brazen lava. There is where sin was dealt with. Then there was the holy place, and in that were three articles of furniture, all spoke of worship and the person of Christ. The golden lampstand, the golden altar, and the table of showbread. Then inside the holy of holies, there was the ark, and over it the mercy seat. And this was where God met with his people. And I suppose the ark is the best picture of Christ that we have in the Old Testament. And it's the only picture actually God ever painted. I do not care about the paintings of Christ that picture a man of the Middle Ages and the way he looked. I do not know how the Lord Jesus looked. There are those today that are trying to say, that he was a white man, those that say he was a black man, those that say he was a swarthy, dark complexion. I personally would think of him as being between that. I think his skin was bronzed. But I don't know that because we're not told a thing. But here is a picture of him in the tabernacle. And actually the ark was just a box, two and a half cubits by one and a half cubits by one and a half cubits. Bezalel was given a special ministry by the Spirit of God, that he might make it. And the ark, you see, denoting the presence of God, became a hindrance to Israel because they looked at it in a superstitious way. They thought there was some merit in that box, and there wasn't. It just was a symbol, a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was made of gold, speaking of his deity, and of wood, speaking of his humanity, and it wasn't two boxes, it was one box. It wasn't a wooden box, it wasn't a gold box, it was both, if you please. And he's the God-man, or as the oldest creed says, he's very man of very man, 
and he's very God of very God. Now, you will recall that during the time of Samuel, the Philistines had gotten the ark, and they were very superstitious about it. They put it on a wagon and left it in the field of Abinadab, stayed there 70 years. Then when David captured Jerusalem, he wanted to move the ark up to Jerusalem. He felt that that was the place for it, and I think that he had ample justification for it. And one of the things that the king was told in verse 16 of Deuteronomy 17, he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses, for as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. And this man was to establish there a capital. And when he took Jerusalem, he made it the capital. And out under it, Kerjif, Jerim, eight miles west of Jerusalem, there was the ark. And David had a passion and love for God that is seldom found today. I'll be honest with you, I do not go along with these folk that are everlastingly criticizing David. I only wish in my own heart that I had that love and passion for God that he had listened to him. You know what this man could say, and he could say it from the depths of his heart in a most wonderful way. He could say, listen to this, and it's a glorious thing. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be able to say? I'll praise the Lord with my whole heart. Listen to David again in Psalm 108, 1. O oh God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. That is the thing that was in the heart of this man. And then again, over in Psalm 103, verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. Isn't that wonderful? David had a passion and love for God, so he wanted to bring up the ark of God. And you will find now that's what he's going to attempt to do here in chapter 6. And he does it in the wrong way. Now, the ark is mentioned here 15 times in the first 17 verses. And after you read this section, I hope you'll read it, you will find out that the Lord is talking about the ark of the Lord. <laughs> that seems to be the subject. And it seemed to be rather important to David and important to the Lord. You know, I think at least 11 of the Psalms were composed around this incident. And I think the 23rd Psalm was composed around bringing this ark up to Jerusalem. And you can be sure of one thing that David didn't have some peculiar, superstitious viewpoint of this at all. David knew where the Lord was. He wasn't in that box. He says in Psalm 123, 1, Under thee lift I up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. David knew where God was, but he knew that this was the approach that was made to God, it spoke of a mediator between God and man. Now, will you notice what he wants to do? And I've given all this preliminary, because I think this chapter is rather important. Now, let me read verse 1. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David rose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. <laughs> now, that's where David made his mistake. Somebody said, well, the Philistines did it, and they got away with it. They got away with it because they were ignorant, you know? Light creates responsibility. Now, I'm not going to argue with you today about the heathen out in Africa, but I would like to argue with you about the heathen in Los Angeles and the heathen in your town, because they can hear the gospel, and their responsibility is great. And if you turn your back on Jesus Christ, my friend, 
May I say to you, you can argue about the heathen all you want to, but when you turn your back on Jesus Christ, you are lost and doomed and judged and go to an eternal hell. That's the teaching of the Word of God. Now, you may not like it, but if you don't like it, you ought to move out of this universe into another one, because this is God's universe. He's made the rules. He says it's this way. This is, I think, very important for us to note here. Now, let me move on. He's doing this in a wrong way now. He brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah and Uzzah, and Ahio, the son of Abinadab, drave the new cart. Now, the ark was back in the instructions that were made for it. It had four rings on it, two on each side. Staves were put between those rings. And on the wilderness march, the Kohathites came and put that ark on their shoulders. And they carried that ark through the wilderness. That's God's instruction today for you and me. I sometimes wonder why he doesn't get a better instrument than I am and why he doesn't write the gospel in the sky today. But Jesus Christ has to be carried through this world on the shoulders of those that are his own. That is God's way of doing it. That's his way here. And David's wrong, and he's so wrong. He's going to get in trouble, as God's people always get in trouble when we do it wrong. What is said here, verse 5, And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments, made of fir wood, even on harps, on psalteries, timbrels, cornets, and on cymbal. I want to tell you, David was a musician. He believed in having a lot of music, and they're bringing up the ark with a great deal of music. Now, when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Now, that's pretty serious. You say, well, that's a small breach of conduct for such extreme punishment. It so affected David that it stopped the procession. And the ark is now left in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite here. And David was rather angry with the Lord. Well, you notice, but God was angry also. God was angry because he's doing it in the wrong way. Verse 8, And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon us, and he called the name of the place Perizazah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And you and I do well to be afraid of him, friends. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And a great many people need to recognize that God's going to judge. I do not know about you, but I'm a little weary of hearing all this love, love, lovey, dovey stuff. Sure, God is love, and sure, God loves you. But my friend, you can go on in sin. You can turn your back on him. And my friend, you're lost. There's no way out of it. There's no other alternative. No man cometh to the Father but by me, said the Lord Jesus. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him, unto the city of David, but David carried it aside unto the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom unto the city of of David with gladness. And how is he going to bring it up now? On the shoulders of the priests. Verse 13, it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. Now I know that there are going to be a great many eyebrows arched at this statement, but I didn't put it. In the Word of God, God did this. David danced by himself. This hasn't anything in the world to do with sex. Any kind of a dance today, and I do not care how you try to cover it up with culture and refinement, every dance today is a sex dance. 
This is the dance of worship. Now, if you could have that kind, I'd be for it, but I don't think you can have it, my friend. I don't find people in love with God like this man David is here. And David is rejoicing before God. I personally would just like to see a few more people rejoicing and praising God today, not concerned about the dancing. We'll talk about that later. But this business of long faces and coming in, God doesn't like it, my friend. He says, come into my presence with joy. And David is coming in with joy. You may be sure of that. Now we're told here, so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. She did not like to see anyone that was in love with God like that, and she despised David for it. And she's his wife. May I say to you that this is a very serious thing as far as she is concerned and her relationship to David. Verse 17, they brought in the ark of the Lord. They set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Those burnt offerings speak of the person of Christ. Those peace offerings speak of the peace that is made by the blood of his cross and that there was that relationship, that wonderful relationship between God and David. Friends today, now let's push aside a great deal of this extraneous argument that we have today about dancing before the Lord and about smiting this man dead. I know you can argue about those things, but here they are in the Word of God. Let's not argue religion today, and let's get right down to the nitty-gritty. What about your relationship to God, and what about mine? Now, right now, wherever you are, however you are, how is it with you and God? Have you had a talk with him today? <laughs> Have you rejoiced in him? Do you love him today? Do you want to serve him? What is your personal relationship to God today, my friend? That is important, is it not? Now, let's not talk about David dancing before the Lord, and let's not talk about this man as of being smitten dead. Here it is in the Word of God. You have to take it like it's written. But the important thing here, here is a man that is in love with God, rightly related to God, and thrilled to live this life down here. Oh, that you and I might have the joy of the Lord today. Verse 20. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. Well, David got down and acted like the rest of the crowd. He just mingled and mixed among the crowd and thanked God and rejoiced in the fact the ark was being brought up. And she didn't like that. She liked dignity and reverence and worship, you know. I'm always afraid of the super-duper pious folk that are everlastingly talking about, you know, this matter of being very dedicated and very pious. My friend, watch those folk. They're dangerous folk. I love them like David. What a man of God. David said unto Michael, It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all the house of Israel to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. What David is saying, I'll rejoice. I wish people had a better time when they went to church. They'd enjoy it more, friends. And David goes on to say, And I'll yet be more vile than thus. Now, when he says vile, he says I don't mind being informal in my worship to God. And of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. David put her aside, my friend, because of that. Now, this is a tremendous chapter, is it not? I've only 
really touch the high points that are here. I wish I could have gone in more in depth here. Our friends, we come in Second Samuel 7 to God's covenant with David. And very frankly, it's very difficult to understand the prophets from here on without knowing about this covenant. One of the reasons that so many in the study of prophecy find themselves hopelessly confused because of the fact they do not pay attention to a chapter like this. This is by far the most significant chapter that we've come to in the Old Testament. Now, the New Testament opens right here. You will recall that it opens the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of who? David. That's important because the promises God made to David are to be fulfilled in Christ. And you remember when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, as Dr. Luke records it, it says, He shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That's important. That goes back here to this chapter. And Peter, on the day of Pentecost, made reference to this, that God had promised to David. And Paul in Romans says, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David. And the New Testament closes, friends, in the book of Revelation, and the Lord Jesus is saying, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. There are 59 references to David in the New Testament. And the Old Testament prophets base the kingdom on this promise. You will find that every one of the Old Testament prophets always went back to David, always went back to the promise God made to David, to the kingdom that God had promised to David. And after all, what is the kingdom of heaven but the kingdom that God vouchsafed to David? Listen to Jeremiah, and I'll only give one example. In Jeremiah 23, 5, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. This became the theme song of the prophets was this. Now will you notice as we come to this chapter, it's a very wonderful chapter. Let me read now, beginning with verse 1. And it came to pass, when the king sat on his throne, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that's in thine heart, for the Lord's with thee. Now notice the background of this. We have seen that David took Jerusalem, and David built there on Mount Zion his palace. Hiram, king of Tyre, built it for him. Then we saw last time that David brought up the ark to the city of Jerusalem. And then I think it must have been a rainy night in Jerusalem. The first night I ever spent in Jerusalem, it rained. And I thought it must have been a night like that. When David waked up and he heard the pitter-patter of the rain on that lovely palace that had been built for him by Hiram, his friend. Then he thought of God's ark out yonder in a tent. And I suppose he maybe could hear the flapping of the tent. And he thought, my, I want to build God a house. And he then called in Nathan, his prophet, and divulged to him his heart. He says, I dwell in a house of cedar. But the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. Now, here is a case where a prophet was wrong. And I mean wrong, friends. Nathan said to the king, you go and do all that's in your heart. And I would have said the same thing. Fact of the matter is, if someone came to me or wrote me and said, Dr. McGee, we want to underwrite your radio ministry in a certain section or a certain station, 
I'll be very frank with you. I wouldn't say, well, now let me go and pray about this and see whether this is what ought to be done or not. I'd say, yes, this is what we want. May I say, it might be, it wouldn't be in the will of God. But Nathan here, I can understand how Nathan felt, why Nathan said, why, if you want to build God a house, that's the most wonderful thing I can think of. Go do all that's in your heart. But he was wrong. You see, David, as we've indicated before, he's a bloody man. Long before he ever committed that sin, he was a bloody man. God had said, you can't build me the temple. It is in the heart of David, and God gives him credit for it. And I think that we make a mistake calling it Solomon's temple. Solomon never built a temple. David gathered the materials, made all the arrangements with the contractors, and Solomon just carried it out. The only temple Solomon ever had is on the side of his head. It ought to be David's temple. Now, will you notice, God had to correct Nathan. It came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. Now he says, you're going to have to go and correct this word you've given to David. You go tell David that I appreciate the fact that he wants to build me a house. And I never ask him to do it. I never ask any of my people to build me a house. And he says that I dwelt in a tent with them. That's where God met them. In other words, God identified himself with his people. And friends, that's the reason 1,900 years ago he came down here and took upon himself our humanity. And the very interesting thing is the same word is used by John. He says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt means pitched his tent here among us. Instead of in a flimsy tent made of linen, he now is in a flimsy tent made of flesh. And he came down here and identified himself with us. God's always identified himself with his people. Now he tells David, I never asked them to ever build me a house. Verse 7, In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me a house of cedar? Now, that's verse 7. God says, I never asked them to build me a house of cedar at all. I asked none of them. In other words, this was David's idea. And God gives him credit for it. And God, I think, gives him credit for building the temple. Now, will you notice? It says, Now, therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Now, God tells him what he's done for him. Listen to this and what he's going to do with him. Now, listen. This is very important. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. Now, this is verse 8, and God says, David, you were a little shepherd boy, and I chose you, I picked you, and I've made you ruler over my people. Now, listen to what the Lord says he's done for him. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Now, in God's book, David ranks as one of the great men that have lived on this earth. And I think David will compare to any ruler that's ever been on the earth today. I think he's outstanding. I think it's God's intention when he's raised from the dead for eternity that this man is going to rule on this earth down here. I believe that he'll be the vicegerent of the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth. Now, will you notice verse 10? Listen to what God says he's going to do. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. That's wrapped up in God's covenant with David. And I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And friends, that was a long time ago. Actually, that was over 3,000 years ago. And this hasn't been made good yet, but God's going to make it good. Now, will you notice verse 11? And as since the time 
that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies. Also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. God says, you go tell David that God will make him a house. God will do something. This is what God will do. Now, isn't this a lovely thing? And it's just like the Lord, my friend. David says, I want to build God a house. God says, David, you can't do it. Your hands are bloody. You can't build me a house. What's in your heart? You want to build me a house. I give you credit for building me a house. (laughs) But I'm going to build you a house. Isn't that just like the Lord? You can't do anything for the Lord. He doesn't turn around and do it for you, friends, even more. So that's the reason so many of us are so poor today. We do so little, you know, for the Lord. And we're not even in a position where he can do a great deal for us. And God says, go tell David that he'll build David a house. Now, listen to this. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I'll establish his kingdom. This is tremendous, friends. fact of the matter is, this is something that is outstanding. What did we quote from the Old Testament in the New Testament when Paul said in Romans concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of what? The seed of David. God says to David, I'm going to make thy seed. After thee, he'll establish the kingdom. That certainly wasn't Solomon. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, listen to what God says. Verse 13, he shall build a house for my name. Now, we're talking about Solomon. He's the next in line. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. But the kingdom goes beyond Solomon. And it looks on to the future. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is the throne of David now. It'll be established forever. Now, we're told he's going to sit again. That's what the Lord said through the angel Gabriel to Mary. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And listen to this. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, again, listen to God's I will. I will be his father. And that's a unique way, you see. The Lord Jesus, after his resurrection, he said to Mary, I send to my father, your father. He's the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's because of his position in the Trinity. But he's my father too. But that's by regeneration. To as many as received him. And when I received Christ as my Savior, to as many as received him, to them gave he the right, the exousion power, to become the sons of God, even to those that don't do any more nor less than just simply believe in his name. He says, I'll be his father, and he shall be my son. Now, listen to this, though. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of man and with the stripes of the children of man. Now, that, you must admit, is a very strange statement. Now, Bishop Horsley gives a translation here of verse 14 that is interesting. Watch your Bible now as I give this translation. When guilt is laid upon him, I will chasten him with the rod of man. That's exactly what God is saying now. He says, when guilt is laid upon him, he's going to be his father, and he'll be my son. That's the unique relationship between God the Father and God the Son. But if he commit iniquity, that's when iniquity is laid upon him. And then my sin was put upon him. With his stripes we're healed, you see. He died on the cross for you and me. He was delivered for our offenses. That's the reason that he's dying on the cross. It's for your offenses and it's for our offenses and my offenses that he died there. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins might live under righteousness, by whose stripes we heal. We heal from sin. You see, that is the thing. When sin's laid upon him, and it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. And again, that's what the prophet says. 
concerning this one, by the way, that's coming in David's line. There would be put upon him the sins of the world, and he hath borne our griefs, he's carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we're healed. Healed of what? Healed of sin. That is the awful disease today of mankind is sin, my beloved. Now he says this here. God says to him, I'll chasten him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. In other words, though the Lion of David sinned grievously, God went right on through to carry out his purpose in bringing in that line, he brought the Lord Jesus into the world. Now we are told here in verse 16, And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee, Thy throne shall be established forever. Now, you know, God thought that that was pretty important. And you know why? Because even in the 89th Psalm, at verse 34, God says, My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing which is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I'll not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, and as a faithful witness in heaven. Established as the moon. And they brought back some rocks from the moon. And I notice now they're saying that this universe is probably three to five billion years old because these rocks from the moon. Well, God's already beat them to it. God says, I'll establish it. It'll be just as established as the moon. Well, it's been here five billion years, friend. That's a long time. And I rather agree it's been around here a long time. God says, I've made a covenant with David. Now, notice David's reaction to all of this. We are told according to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. That's verse 17. Now listen to David. Verse 18, Then went King David in, sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O Lord God, but thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. And is this the manner of the man, O Lord God? Now, let me change that a little and give you, again, Bishop Horsley's translation here. Follow yours, your translation. I'm reading. O Lord God, thou hast spoken of thy servant's house for a great while to come, and hast regarded me in the arrangement about the man that is to be from above, O God Jehovah. That's a remarkable statement. They were looking for one to come. And he was to be the seed of the woman. He was to be from Abraham. He is to come in the tribe of Judah. Now, we're told, it'll be the family of David. He's going to be in David's line, and David is overwhelmed by this. Now, listen to David, verse 20. And what can David say more unto thee? For thou, O Lord God, knowest thy servant. Have you ever poured out your heart to God, and then you just didn't have anything to say? You're just empty. You're just there before him in prayer, sometimes riding along. And I pray riding along. I tell him all I can tell him. I can't even think of anything else to say. How wonderful he is. How wonderful our God is. Now, will you notice? He says, For thy word's sake and according to thine own heart hast thou done all these great things to make thy servant know them. Now, did God do this for David? Because David was a nice boy. He wasn't a nice boy, friends. We're going to see that. And God didn't save you, and he didn't save me because we're nice boys. He did it because of his marvelous, infinite grace. And he does so many wonderful things for us even today. And it's not because of our goodness. It's because of his goodness. He's wonderful. We're not. <laughs> He's the one that's wonderful, friends, and we ought to praise his name. Oh, I'd like to read all this down. I won't be able to do that 
David is just overwhelmed by all of this. No wonder he could sing those wonderful psalms. And he says here in verse 22, Wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we've heard with our ears. Doesn't this just do you good to read it, friends? My, to have a God like this. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel. I'll have to drop on down now. Notice verse 25. And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. And do you know that this became actually David's salvation? Listen to him at the end of his life. Over in Second Samuel 23, 5, this is what David says. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure, for this is my salvation. David says, I rest upon what God has promised. And you know, he made a promise to us, to you. He says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Will you believe God? David believed God. We've seen that. Abraham believed God. We've seen that. Moses believed God. Joshua believed God. And he wants you to believe God. Whatever your name is, he's saying to you today, believe me, I'll save you if you'll trust Christ as your Savior. That's his covenant with us today. And friends, this is a covenant that just became very important and we'll call attention to it from time to time and pursue it further. Now today, friends, we continue on in the story of David as we follow his exploits. He's now been made king. He's brought the ark of God up to Jerusalem. And when he got it up there, he wanted to build God a house. God told him that he would not be able to do it himself, but that God would build David a house. And then the Lord made his covenant with David, a great covenant, and actually whole prophecies that follow most of the book of Psalms rest upon that covenant God made with David. The kingdom is the kingdom that you find here in that seventh chapter of Second Samuel. And so we come now to the eighth chapter and we see David now being fully established in the kingdom. And I want to begin reading here at verse 1. After this, that is, after God made his covenant with David, it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And we find that he had a great victory over them. They were the perpetual and inveterate enemies of Israel. And David drove them back, not only out of the land of Israel, but drove them even beyond their own borders and enlarged his own borders because they were in a great section of that land, especially the second session, that is, southern part. Now, in verse 4, I read, and David took from him. This is the king of Zobab. He had a border that went as far as the river Euphrates. And we are told that David took from him a thousand chariots, 700 horsemen, 20,000 footmen. And David hewed all the chariot horses, but reserved of them for a hundred chariots. Quite interesting the way David got rid of these horses. We were told back in Deuteronomy, God made a rule for the kings. One of the rules was just simply this, he's not to multiply horses. And it's also interesting to note, he was not to multiply horses or wives. David multiplied wives. And we find that Solomon multiplied both horses and wives. But David apparently here is attempting to follow the Lord in this particular matter. Now, I'm not going into any more detail in this chapter 
for those of you who like to explore new areas, new land, you would enjoy taking this chapter and seeing the different areas in which David moved. He enlarged the borders of Israel. Now he extended them in the south. He extended them to the east in the land of the Moabites. And we find here he extended them in the north, the Syrians of Damascus. David was able to take them. And so we find that Syria and Moab, Ammon and the Philistines and the Amalekites, all of these became subject to David. And we are told in verse 13, And David got him a name when he returned from smiting of the Assyrians in the valley of Salt, being 18,000 men. And we are told he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom put he garrisons, and all they of Edom became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. So that now is in the south to the east, in the southwest, southeast, and to the east, and now to the north, why David was able to push back his borders, enlarge the kingdom. Wasn't any use to say he pushed them to the west, because that's where the ocean was, and they had already were that far. The border in the west was the Mediterranean Sea. Now we're told in verse 15, And David reigned over all Israel. And David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. David was noted for that. We find that there's a tremendous now expansion and extension of the kingdom. And David now actually brought the kingdom to its zenith and made it really a world power in that day that would correspond to the other kingdoms of that day. Now, that brings us to the ninth chapter of Second Samuel, and we come here to one of the loveliest stories that you have in the Scripture. And this is a story that, very frankly, it reveals what a great man David really was. We always think of David in connection with that sin he committed, and probably that's a natural thing to do. For instance, suppose I had before me right now a great white sheet right before me. All of you that are listening can imagine that. Now, let me say that there is one little black spot on that screen. Some ink got on that. Now, as you look at the white screen, what is the most impressive thing about it? There is this vast area of white, but when you put a picture on the screen, that is, you put one little black spot, that stands out. Suppose that you ride down the highway, as I have done in West Texas, and you see probably a couple thousand sheep over in the field, and there's one that's black. Which sheep do you really see? Well, in the life of David... We always concentrate on the one big sin, and it was a big one. We'll deal with it when we get to it. But we give sparse attention to his noble life, to the exploits of this man. Someone has put it like this, there's so much good in the worst of us and so much bad in the best of us that it behooves most of us not to talk about the rest of us. Maybe... We ought to be a little bit more careful about our viewpoint of David. Now, there's so many wonderful, bright spots in the long life of David. From that young shepherd boy who slew a giant to an old man wise in experience and who could write, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, here we're looking at one of those events. In chapter 9, we have the story of Mephibosheth. You remember I mentioned him once before? Now we've come to him. He was a grandson of Saul, but he was a son of Jonathan. And we're told here that David now befriends him. Now you must recall the background that Saul had been the pitiless foe and the bitter enemy of David. And at the death of Saul, David began to marshal his forces. 
And according to the Oriental custom of that day, it was the law of that day, a new king would naturally put to death all contenders to the throne of a former dynasty. Any claimant would be removed by execution. That would protect him, you see. Now, according to the code of that day, David would have been justified in putting to death any of the offspring of Saul. And believe me, David was not amiss or squeamish in doing such things, even among his followers. How about the story of Uriah the Hittite? Well, Jonathan, the son of Saul, died with his father in the same battle. But Jonathan had a son. He'd been hidden away, lest David take him and kill him. And the name of this boy was Mephibosheth. And David could more firmly establish his throne by slaying Mephibosheth, removing the last vestige of danger. But Ziba, a servant of Saul, betrayed the hiding place of Mephibosheth, and David could have taken him and killed him. Now listen to the story. I begin reading at chapter 9, verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thy Ziba? He said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he's in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David sent, fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. Now you see, when Mephibosheth came before David, he fully expected to be executed. He was a dead dog, if you please. And David, when he was brought before him, Mephibosheth falls down on his face before David. And David speaks so kindly to him, just calls him by name. He says, Mephibosheth. And this boy says, Behold thy servant, David said unto him, Fear not, for I'll surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and I'll restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Now, isn't that a lovely thing that he does? David puts him at ease, you see, and David shows him kindness. He restores his inheritance to him, and he gave him a place at the king's table. Now, notice the reaction of Mephibosheth to all of this. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldst look upon such a dead dog as I am? And believe me, had there been another king on the throne, and had that king been his own father, and he had been the son of David, been a different story. He'd have been slain. You may be sure of that. This is something that is amazing why Mephibosheth counts himself as a dead dog. But David doesn't call him that. David says, you're no dead dog. You're Mephibosheth. You're the son of Jonathan. And he says to him, I intend to show kindness to you. And now will you notice the reaction again of this man? He bowed himself. What is thy servant that thou shouldst look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servant shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread alway at my table." Now, Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. 
That's quite a household to feed, you see. So this property and land of Saul's that was his inheritance was turned over to him, but it belongs to Mephibosheth. David sees that it belongs to him. Now, here is something that is quite interesting that I want you to note. Thou therefore and thy sons, and I'm reading verse 10, and thy servants shall till the land for him, shall bring in the fruits, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread all the way at my table. Now, Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Verse 11, Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table, and he was lame on both his feet. Now, I want you to notice this. This is such a lovely gesture on the part of David, and it's one of those acts of nobility which David performed. You remember in the case of Abigail, he did the same thing when her husband, actually his name means a fool, and you can call him stupid, acted as he did. Why, it was at that time that David did a very noble thing in sparing this man who had done this thing to him. The fact of the matter is, it insulted him. Now, will you notice that not only is this a wonderful act, but there's some impressive lessons here for us. They're great spiritual truths, and I wouldn't want you to miss them today. First of all, a child of God should recognize that he too is a cripple. You see, we're told their feet are swift to shed blood. That's the report from God's clinic of the human race. They've all gone out of the way. Our feet lead us astray. Each one, we're told, is turned to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then again, Proverbs says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, our feet get us in trouble. And it's quite interesting in the way that the soul and the feet are closely connected in Scripture. And I do not mean to make a bad pun, but I'm not talking about the soul of your feet. The soul, S-O-U-L, and the feet are closely put together in Scripture. I'd like for you to notice that. Over in Psalm 56, verse 13, listen to this. For thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of thy living? And that's David who wrote that. And remember, he had a boy all of his life at his table who was lame in both of his feet. And then in Psalm 73, verse 2, he says here, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. David knew what it was to have lame feet also. And then in Psalm 116, verse 8, we read there, For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. So that you and I are actually cripples before God. But you know, today, modern philosophy and humanism presents another picture of man. I heard a liberal say Christ came to reveal the splendors of the human soul. Well, God says out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, and it's a mess of bad things. You can't expect any good from human nature. Paul could say, I know that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And he says he had no confidence in the flesh. This is the way, God says, walk ye in it. But the law is condemnation. But the Lord Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me, and when we come that way, he'll receive us. Now, there's something else that's amazing in this incident. David extended kindness to Mephibosheth for the sake of Jonathan. Not because of Mephibosheth. He didn't know him. It was for the sake of Jonathan that he loved. 
When he looked upon this boy, he didn't see a cripple. He saw Jonathan. He made a covenant with Jonathan. And the kindness and mercy and the grace that he extended was because of another. Now, you want to know what David thought of Jonathan? Well, he thought that he was a very wonderful person. Now, the Lord Jesus has saved you and me because of another. And that other is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're told we're accepted in the Beloved. When he sees you and me in Christ, why, he accepts us and he saves us. Now, the interesting thing is this. David said nothing about the lame feet of Mephibosheth. There's no record that David ever mentioned it. He made no allusion to it. He never said to him, it's too bad that you're a cripple. He treated him as a prince. And he sat at the table and his feet were covered with a linen cloth. You know, God forgets sins because they've been blotted out by the death of Christ. They've been covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way God can forgive you and me our sins, my friend. This is the way he put it in Hebrews 10:17. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And then here's something else I'd have you note here. Mephibosheth said nothing about his lame feet. You see, what do you think David and Mephibosheth talked about when they sat at the table? They talked about another. And you know who that was? It was about Jonathan. David loved Jonathan. Mephibosheth loved Jonathan. He was his father. They talked about him. What do you and I talk about? You know, some Christians take a keen delight in telling about the old days when they lived in sin. They also take keen delight in running some other Christian down. It's too bad when we get together we don't talk like David and Mephibosheth did about not Jonathan, but about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, you know, others that were at the table, they didn't talk about his lame feet. There's a large company that ate at the table of a king, and one day they saw David bringing this little cripple, and the gossips did not say, did you hear how it happened? They listened to the king. They heard him praise him. They had no time to indulge in cheap talk. Their hearts went out in love to this boy, Mephibosheth. You see, love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, and love never fails. These things, you see, have been written for our admonition. David was never able to make this boy walk as far as I can tell. If you see that, you cannot walk well-pleasing to God. Turn to him. Turn to the Lord Jesus. He said to the palsied man, Let down through the roof, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee, rise and walk. And God says that to you and me today. He says, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you walk well-pleasing, that you walk worthy of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And Christ has sent out invitations today in the highways and byways, out in the streets of your town, and he's saying, come to my table of salvation just as you are a cripple, and I'll feed you. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll rest you. And if any man hunger, if any man thirst, let him come unto him and drink. What a wonderful picture this is that we have here in chapter 9 of Second Samuel. Now, friends, as we come here to the 10th chapter, I trust you have your Bible handy where you can turn to it. And I also want to urge you to read the portion that we are studying, and it'll make it more meaningful to you. Also, we would like for you to write in and ask for the notes and outlines you do not have them. Now, we've come in chapter 10, as we've indicated, to the troubles of David. We've seen his triumphs. He's now become one of the great kings of the earth. And here in chapter 10, we see David defeating both the Ammonites and Syrians. But his motive is not, to my judgment, the best. And this is the beginning of revealing the fact that now that David has been exalted to such a high position, 
that he is letting his feelings carry him along. And here his motive is to avenge the insult to his messengers that were sent to Hanan, the king of Ammon. Now, I'll just read a few verses here to get this chapter before us. And then we move to chapter 11, where we have David's great sin. Now, will you notice, it came to pass after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanan his son reigned in his stead. Then said David, I will show kindness unto Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness unto me. And David sent to comfort him by the hand of his servants for his father. And David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. And the princes of the children of Ammon said unto Hanan their lord, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Hath not David rather sent his servants unto thee to search the city and to spy it out? and to overthrow it. Now, you can see that these folk had no confidence at all in David. That is, they believed that David intended to attack them. Wherefore, Hanan took David's servants and shaved off half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. Now, my friend, that was an insult. I can't think of anything that would be more of an insult. But David was a big enough man and now in a position where he actually could ignore this sort of thing. But David didn't do that. Notice what he did. When they told it unto David, he sent to meet them because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown and then return. And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and of King Maacah, 1,000 men, of Ishtob, 12,000 men. They saw that David intended to move now against them. When David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the hosts of the mighty men. Now, David is at this time a skilled general and a warrior that was rugged, and he actually was one of the great kings of the earth. So he was able to overcome the enemy here, and we're told that in verse 18 that the Syrians fled before Israel, and David slew the men of 700 chariots and of the Syrians and 40,000 horsemen. A great slaughter. It looks as if David is really taking personal revenge. So the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon anymore. Now, this establishes David without doubt as the great ruler of that day.